get an early start today. We have dense early morning fog. Otherwise, it'll be partly cloudy and warm today with a slight chance of afternoon showers. High 80. Partly cloudy and warm tonight with a chance of showers. Overnight low 66. Then partly cloudy and warmer for Tuesday with again a chance of showers. High 82. I'm meteorologist Christine Summers for Tampa Bay's Warm 107 FM. In Tampa, it's 64 degrees. Day breaks over Clearwater Bay in Tampa, and Nigel Mansell sets off on his bicycle for a routine training session. He's accompanied by Alex Plusko, the architect of his new home in the Sunshine State of Florida. The move to this subtropical climate for the winter is all part of the master plan to hone Nigel to the peak of physical fitness in pursuit of his ultimate dream. Already three times runner-up in the World Championship, Nigel's leaving nothing in his personal preparation to chance. His desire to win that coveted crown isn't diminished. Indeed, it's fueled by a perpetual self-belief. He's also comfortable with a leaner, lighter look, achieved purely through hard work in the gym and self-denial at the dinner table. This Christmas, virtually complete no-fat diet. Uh, I might cheat and have some ice cream now and again. But I can cheat because of the amount of exercise I'm taking in the day. Getting on the scales before coming down here in the gym tonight. From the week after Christmas to now, I've genuinely lost 14 pounds. Uh, and my stomach's gone in about two and a half inches. But I mean, I'm stuck there, I can't lose anymore. I'm trying, but I don't want to lose my stamina. You've got to be strong, you've got to be able to push your body for two hours solid. Temperatures of 170 degrees in the cockpit. You've got to have concentration, because there isn't a circuit we go to that we're not pulling 200 miles an hour or more. And we're pulling up to five lateral G. We're pulling 18 to 20 positive G. Acceleration, deceleration is two and a half, three G. So you got to be fit. As we approach 1992, you must be really thinking that it's it's now or never. Sort of well, thing. I don't know about now or never, but what I will say to you is is that I'm really quietly optimistic. I mean, I've just come back from a week's testing in Europe, well, fortnight in fact. We have just smashed one of the track records out there. We've just done seven straight days testing. I've done two or three Grand Prix distances. In fact, I did five and a half Grand Prix distances in seven days, which is, you know, a lot of laps. And um, I'm in great shape. I've lost my weight, but I wanted to. I'm focused. Um, there's no passengers. 
there's no surrender this year and uh, you know what will be will be but I would say in my whole career I'm starting the season with uh, more optimism than I've ever had in the past. That optimism persuaded Nigel to uproot his family from the beautiful yet rugged refuge on the Isle of Man. The island, guarded by this lighthouse in the Irish Sea off the west coast of England, was where the Mansells fashioned their dream home, Balaman. Although they were happy in this tranquil private setting, Nigel found it difficult to train there in Formula One's short close season, the winter, because winters on the Isle of Man can be very harsh. Florida and its inherent sunshine provided a more conducive atmosphere for Nigel to prepare himself for the rigours ahead and also more opportunity for precious time with the family already denied his company for so much of the year. Right, make sure your life check is on properly. Alright, come on then, Greg. Jump up, up we come. There we are. In you go. There we are. Okay. That's good. All aboard, are we? All aboard. Yeah. yeah. In place of the lighthouse and the wind, the Mansells now have 300-year-old trees standing guard at their impressive and appropriately named Century Oaks home in a prime location on the Gulf of Mexico. We caught up with Nigel in his cherry wood panelled study. You did say that it's a different way of life here in Florida. Have you fully adjusted yet? Oh yeah, I mean... Uh... I think, I think the funniest thing of all is, is the fact that uh, the English language and the American language is so far removed in certain ways that it's incredibly entertaining and you have to be very, very careful and very astute, in fact, when you're actually speaking to certain people. You know, you have to sort of read their body language because they don't actually understand what you're saying to them. I mean, one of the first uh, funnies we had really was when Rosanne was saying to me in front of some Americans, say, well, what kind of joint would you like on Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and obviously this word uh, in America uh, has a lot of other connotations. It certainly didn't meet. So we, we had a lot of amusement. Yeah, you told a press conference um, in Oxfordshire a few weeks ago that you actually felt like a human being again. Yeah, I mean, that's astonishing. And, you know, even sort of coming back here after being away in Europe for a fortnight, when I was away in a fo for the fortnight last week, I never had a minute's peace. It was, uh, it was incredible, and if my family would have been with me, they would have been quite upset. And coming back here, I'm just sort of a, uh, an average, normal uh, you know, father. Go out with my children, I can take them to McDonald's, I can go shopping, and we can walk the streets with relative ease without being recognised all the time. He returned here to the base of his Williams team for a pre-season press conference en route to winter testing. A relaxed photo call in the superb Williams Museum for the sleeker, fitter Nigel, more fired up than ever before. And then the perennial question, at 37 years of age, does he still believe he can win the World Championship? 
answer obviously is going to be yes. I mean, that's why I'm here. If I didn't really believe that, I couldn't sit here this morning. I really do believe I have a better opportunity this year. But I've got to add because, you know, the rules and regulations have changed. And uh, I don't know whether anyone did the mathematics last year, but the championship would have been a lot closer last year if the rules would have been the same as the year before. You know, but it's a championship uh, with a reliability with it now. 16 races and everyone counts. So you've got to finish, you've got to score points regularly. And we all know who set the standards for that. Just look back historically over the last three or four years and what car finishes more than any other car in the pit lane. Any other car in the pit lane. You know, so, uh, you know, we've had to address this and look at it very seriously. But getting back to your question, absolutely. I want the championship. I'd like it. I'm going to try. I don't know whether I'm going to get it, but I'll try. How has the relationship with Williams team gone over the winter? Exceptionally well. I think the understanding that Williams team has and I have now, Frank Williams and Patrick Head, is uh, the best it's ever been in my career. I think the respect and mutual admiration we have for each other's ability as a team and as a driver is uh, at the highest point. And I feel that um, they are winners, they are racers. They're not there to make the numbers up. I'm not there to make the numbers up. We're there to get the job done this year, and that's to win the World Championship. And I think we have a, a real um, parallel objective this year and I'm very very comfortable with it. A race of a different kind will take place on the other side of town this weekend for this is Johannesburg the largest city in South Africa and venue for the first race in the Formula One championship. Well welcome to Johannesburg as you can see we're getting down to some serious business now the first visit to the golf course it's about 10 minutes away from the circuit uh, I'm looking forward very, very much to an exciting week. It's been a long winter, it's been a hard winter, but I mean, as you can see, I want to get down to something really serious today, which is a game of golf. Thank you for being with us. I think you'll enjoy this week. Stay with us, and let's hope no one will overtake you or me this weekend. Thank you. In a little over a hundred years, Johannesburg has developed from a gold mining camp into a modern city the financial and commercial hub of the prosperous Witwatersland. In the shadow of the city lies Kyalami. Much has changed in the country since the last Formula One race here in 1985, including the circuit, which has had more than £15 million spent on a complete rebuild. Hundreds of workers have toiled around the clock since Christmas to have the circuit ready, and the work continues long after sundown on the eve of the race. The 4.26 kilometre track will be lapped in around 1 minute 15 seconds. Against the backdrop of an African sunset, the bright lights of the Santon Sun Hotel create a vivid image. This five-star luxury hotel is Nigel's home for the week, as indeed it is also for other drivers, teams of mechanics, journalists and race officials. Nigel catches up on the cricket news before we catch up with him. After seeing him enjoying some precious moments with his wife, Roseanne, and children only last week in Florida, we wondered whether the winter break had gone all too quickly. Yeah, what I would like to say is that uh, I could take another three months holiday right now. I mean, here we are the night before sort of driving the car in the South African Grand Prix, or at least I should say starting testing for the South African Grand Prix. And... Uh, yeah, I think I'm ready, but I could do with about three months more holiday. And uh, I believe they've had the heat wave for, for quite a number of weeks. That's going to happen. Yeah, it's astonishing. They've, they've actually had um, the hottest summer this year for the last 30 years. So, I mean, uh, you know, there's quite a drought in places, and it is extremely warm. But the, the physical implications on you are going to be quite great in the race, aren't they? I think on everybody, and of course, you know, on myself individually as well, it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be astonishing because there's not going to be any reprieve on this racetrack for ha to having a rest, to breathe properly because it's little, two little straights in all corners. And some of the corners are incredibly demanding and very fast. And so you're going to be hanging on and you're going to be working in the heat and the, obviously the altitude. So it's going to take its toll on a lot of people. 
And of course the heat and um, the thin air is going to be stressful for the engine and the tyres as well. Sure, I mean, I mean the whole environment, the team, I mean, uh, just digressing for a minute, some of the mechanics uh, fallen ill and I think one's actually had to go to the hospital. I mean, that's basic to the uh, climatic conditions here and the altitude. And then, you know, of course the engine and the aerodynamics is, I think, 25 or 27 percent less oxygen in the air and so it's less drag and, uh, but it's, you know, it makes life a lot harder for the engine to work and uh, certainly has to. So, I mean, you know, you've got to keep an eye on everything. After a night's rest, and while most ordinary folk were having breakfast, where was Nigel? <laughs> In the gymnasium, still sweating off the pounds before going to the circuit for a pre-season weigh-in. Weigh-in just once at the start of the season. Once at the start of the season, and then actually wait for the eight races. And then they have it once, twice, sorry. And they have it after eight races, before the next eight, and actually wait for the next eight. So you get two weigh-ins a year. In other sports, such as athletics, where there's rigorous um, drug procedures, does any of that occur? Well, yeah, every race you can be tested. It just isn't in our game. There's no reason for it. If you take anything in our game, you're taking your life in hands. You're not going to fall over on a grass field or, you know, have a problem. We're travelling at speeds, as you know, over 200 miles an hour. We don't want any impaired vision or, you know, Good feeling. The good feeling comes from adrenaline. We make our own drug. Another 20 minutes of gruelling workout ensured the desired result of the winter's work. In the last three years, as you know, I had the accolade of being the heaviest driver in Formula One. Well, you know who's one of the lightest drivers today, don't you? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Brilliant. Plus over four kilos, so a little bit of more power to weight ratio, so I'm really happy about that. Clearly delighted at the results of his rigorous diet and exercise plan, Nigel stepped into his car and proceeded to devour the new Kyle Army track in the fastest time of the day. Left in his wake, the two McLarens of Berger and Senna, as well as his heavier teammate, Riccardo Patrese. Day one, and the plan so far failed safe. So it's off with friends for a venomous encounter of a different kind. Uh, <laughs> Look at everyone. Look at everyone, eh? Well, you just touched on the rarest snake in the world. What is it? It's an Angolan dwarf python. Is it? There's only 23 of these known. And we've got three of those. We're getting another one in about two weeks' time. Oh, do you feel that, oh, Matthew? We've got three males, and uh, well, we're getting a female. Have you had a feel, Matthew? Which end have you got the head? Oh, I've got the head, okay. Yeah. Okay, I don't that. Put your hand out. Yeah, yeah. I'm not so sure about this. <laughs> right. Yeah, do you want to have a go? Can I hold him, Matthew? Yeah, sorry. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's a very pretty snake. Yeah, it's a very pretty snake. Yeah, it's a very pretty snake. That's the one we couldn't find. Yeah, hey, Robin, do you want to come on? Come on. Oh. Come on, this is your last chance. Come on, come on, come on, drop him. Come on, he's all right. His tongue tickles, but it's all right. I've got a job to do when I get there. The chief of police for the Isle of Man isn't so keen to follow in Nigel's footsteps there, but his wife Robin takes up the challenge. Yeah. Well, I'd just like everybody to know that uh, this is a big first in my life. I know I'm only sort of 22 years of age, but it's the first time today I've ever held a snake. <laughs> <laughs> or ever one. Ever one to maybe. <laughs> but uh, if I can thank Scott, I think it's been most generous what he's been able to do for us today. And uh, on behalf of all of us and the television company, we're very grateful. Thank you. And so it was on to a sponsor's function in another Johannesburg hotel that evening. Cannon, one of the Williams team major sponsors, were the party hosts and Nigel was to be guest of honour. 
the highlight of the evening, a quick spin around the circuit. Well, believe it or not, you are flat out and 60 all the way around to there. You do not lift. That's the secret. Well, I mean, the only trouble is you leave your left one behind here. <laughs> I'm going to keep you guessing. Breaking very hard, fourth, third. And was anyone watching on this corner today? You didn't see me spin off and hit the curve, did you? You must have blinked. So, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and through here, absolutely flat. So, you're probably doing again another 280 k's here. Breaking very hard and taking this off second and third. Now, why do I say second or third? If you do it right, you can take it in third. If you <laughs> screw it up a bit, it's second. Bless <laughs> you. Third, thank you. Uh, fourth, and uh, through here in fifth, and then arriving, breaking very hard here, and um, get down to second, then round. And then if you do that, and you get it all right, you can do one minute, 17.1 seconds. <laughs> Another early start to day two, and time to catch up with an old friend, Nicky Lauda. Beneath that perceived rivalry, the Formula One circuit is a happy scene. And then off to the first of the official sessions at the track. Already the fields around Kyle Army are being gobbled up by parked cars as the faithful fans flock in their thousands. For Nigel, no pretenders to pole position. The only change, Jean Alessi losing out to Michael Schumacher. Time again now to relax at the famous Wanderers Golf Club with a couple of pretty keen golfers. How can I follow that one? Well, here we are again at the end of the game. Mark McNaughty, Nigel Mansell. Guess who won? Mark, tell them all about it. Well, he got lucky again. Hit a few trees back in the middle of the fairway. Hold a few putts, but uh, we managed to halve the game. Right. One day he'll be a good golfer. <laughs> One day. I must be very truthful. Mark's strongest game is chipping and putting. He can hit a very long ball off the tee when he wants to. But I've got to be totally honest, Mark played golf today and I had a wonderful walk. So, Nigel, pole position, just what you wanted? Yes, I mean, uh, fantastic, really. Um, yesterday, provisional pole. Today, confirmed pole. I mean, it's been official qualifying, obviously. Tomorrow, though, Saturday, we've got to repeat it tomorrow, and I think, uh, unfortunately, we've got to find probably another second lap to stay on pole, but, uh, I mean, it's a very comfortable position to be in at the moment, but uh, we've got to try hard again tomorrow. Back at his hotel, Nigel takes time out from his hectic schedule to explain a piece of his racing gear. I've got a little bit of my equipment here, which is my racing helmet. It's a fabulous helmet. It's actually quite light. It's aerodynamically. We have a hole here which lets air in. This is aerodynamically designed here, if you can see, if I can put it to the side and the back, and it actually vents. So when we're actually driving along, we actually have a small airflow which comes along the scalp and uh, just keeps you a little bit cooler because obviously it can get very, very hot. We have a quick release here clip which actually flicks the visor up. It's very, very easy to put it down. One finger will do it, which is very important when you're racing at speeds of over 200 miles an hour. On the side here, there's a few head restraints, so if you're pulling too much G, you can actually put a strap on the side. Most important little piece of equipment is the radio. Uh, you can see here the plug that plugs into the car's radio, and RI do a fantastic job inside the helmet, and I don't know whether you can see, but the padding and the everything, and the differences with the RI helmets, other than the world helmets, 
These are actually molded to a, the driver's individual skull. So measurements are all taken of your head and your jaw and your nose and your eyes and your temples and your ears, in fact, and the helmet is absolutely modeled to you. The other important thing on this helmet is uh, the life support system. This is the support system which supplies oxygen in case of a fire. So we have a button in the car that we can press, and then this is called the life support because in case of a fire, it supplies oxygen which then filters through and comes out roughly opposite your mouth. The helmet itself, well, as I've said to you, for me, it's the best in the world. The manufacturer is our eye. Another day dawns, and it's now the final qualifying session. No problems for the lion-hearted Englishman. He laps in the day's fastest time to secure pole position for the race, and there's nothing the Brazilian Ayrton Senna can do about it. The front of the grid lines up like this. But long after sunset, Nigel and the team are locked in consultation. Is there a problem? Nigel, today's headlines say it all. Well, I mean, uh, the headlines obviously are very flattering, but uh, the hard day's work uh, has just been completed. I'm very pleased to say that we, we managed to go a little bit quicker than yesterday and maintain pole position, which uh, obviously is uh, the best place to be on a track like this. So we start the race uh, tomorrow from pole position, and we just hope that reliability now will uh, give me a fair... Uh, fair shake and uh, you know we can uh, complete the race and all set for tomorrow no problems now well the reason I'm late this evening is we have got problems um, we've got a technical problem with my race car which uh, looks like a decision has been taken now not to race my race car tomorrow I'm going to go in the backup car into the T car I won't tell you exactly what the problem is uh, technically but all I shall say that there's an electrical uh, problem which is intermittent and uh, we've got to try and uh, run the best car tomorrow with the best chance of reliability. And because there's an intermittent problem uh, with my race car, it's best, uh, although it's working fine now, the problem could come back tomorrow in the race. And so a decision has been taken tonight to run the, uh, the T car. Race day and Nigel and party leave the Santon Sun for the last time. What will the day bring? The traffic jams stretch beyond 10 kilometers. Traffic officers have been out in force since 4 a.m. trying to control the flow of an expected 40,000 vehicles. Everyone maintains good spirits. It's been a long time since the Grand Prix was last here. Well, just over 60 minutes away from the uh, beginning of the 1992 South African uh, Grand Prix. Very exciting here. We heard listeners poll quickly about uh, the last half hour ago, and yeah. uh, Mansell has come out of clear wet. 19 calls to 6 calls against Senna. So there oh, well, go. that's good. Mm. Well, let's see what happens, Keith. Yep, absolutely. The best man has to win as long as it's Nigel. I mean, <laughs> There's not much more time to go. Last chance to buy some souvenirs. Official race t-shirts. Come on, get your t-shirts. And for those unlucky enough to be outside the circuit, there's always the television. Like millions of viewers the world over, 44 countries taking live TV coverage of the race. Nigel makes a perfect start in his spare car and leaves the rest of the field trailing in his wake, constantly setting fastest laps and breaking the lap record with three laps to go. A comprehensive start to finish victory for Nigel Mansell, the perfect end to what's been a perfect week in South Africa. A superb start to Nigel's championship aims with a full ten points. Teammate Patrese with six, Senna four, Schumacher three, Berger two, and Johnny Herbert scoring one, 16 points to the Williams Renault team with McLaren Honda on six, Benetton Ford three, and Lotus Ford one. Uh, we've just uh, finished uh, the South African Grand Prix, and I can sit here and almost smile at you and say that we won the race. And uh, I'm really, really happy, and it's almost like a, another fairy tale coming true to start the season on such a high note. I don't think you can do any better than sort of being the quickest three days prior to the race and then actually winning the race. But all credit must, be, must, must go to the Williams-Renault uh, team, the Canon-Williams-Renault team, that is. 
Renault have done fantastic uh, efforts over the winter with the engine, so has Elf Fuel. And of course the Williams team has done uh, just fantastic things over the winter. And of course all the associated sponsors and the mechanics. So it's been a huge team effort and of course uh, I was able to deliver the driving for them today. And that makes me very proud to have managed to do that. Um, did everything go exactly according to plan? Well, I mean, I've got to say, really, yes. I mean, I had plan one over the winter to lose weight. Plan two was to come out the uh, starting blocks and win the first race. And you can guess what plan three is. Mexico City is the largest and fastest growing city on earth. Renowned for poverty and pollution, endless traffic and urban whirl, it also has superb architecture. A charming but ever increasing population of 22 million. A taste for living. A sense of history. Treasures of art. and some magnificent views. Hi everybody and welcome to the uh, second event in the World Championship here in Mexico City. I wish I could say to you that the sun was shining and we have beautiful fresh air to, uh, to breathe, but uh, we've, here we are, we've arrived and uh, everything's uh, looking quite good. The cars are being prepared, probably as I'm speaking to you now. And we're certainly looking forward to uh, an exciting weekend. Safe from the pollution in the hotel, we caught up with Nigel's schedule since South Africa. Um, basically getting back into the home life, um, although I'm very proud to say that we've not missed a day's training and we've eaten well and we've tried to go to bed at sensible times and just keep ourselves in real good condition. The only thing I would say is that in Florida, where we are, everything has blossomed at the same time. And if you suffer with hay fever, this is a bad time. But uh, it's been great. And what's been happening with um, the Williams team? The uh, Williams team has gone testing uh, with our test driver, Damon Hill, and uh, we're progressing things. And, but mainly it was a consolidation this last fortnight. The cars got back about four or five days after the South African race. They've been totally stripped down, totally rebuilt again. And we've just sort of paid very, very uh, good attention to all the small details. And obviously flying them out here to Mexico takes a few days. And uh, the cars are arrived here Sunday or Monday, and they've all been setting up since. Um, have you checked in at the circuit yet? Yes, we went straight to the circuit from the airport this afternoon. And I must confess I have a little bit of trepidation because uh, they've resurfaced the track only a fortnight ago. It was extremely hot at lunchtime, and walking across the track in places, the actual track was coming up on the pumps. So when you put a Formula One car on there, I think that the track will actually tear up in places. So I just hope that they put a lot of cement dust down on top of the surface and seal it. And I hope that it isn't hot tomorrow, because if it is, I can forecast there's going to be a lot of cars spinning off. And uh, the most dangerous thing, of course, is when a Formula One car goes over these sections of track, if it pulls up a lump of tarmac and throws it backwards at over 200 miles an hour and it hits you in the head, then you can have a very serious accident. I believe as well they've, they've altered the Peralta. They've altered it, but unfortunately, uh, I don't think they've made it better. I think, if anything, it's probably worse now than it was before. And the, <clears throat> the whole corner has been resurfaced. And as I said, we have rules in Formula One which are laid down that any circuit, if it's resurfaced, should be done a minimum of 60 days before the race, and then a race should be run on it before a Formula One event. And here we are, we're a fortnight after it's been re resurfaced, and, you know, I think that's um, unreasonable. I just hope that it stays together. In the shadow of Mexico's 1968 Olympic Sports Palace, lies the controversial Peralta curve on the bumpiest, most feared circuit in the world. Despite a qualifying session full of drama and incident, Nigel manages to set the quickest time, more than a second quicker than the emerging young German Michael Schumacher. 
we've done very well today and uh, we have got the provisional pole. Uh, my teammates in third and Michael Shoemaker um, from Benetton is in second place. But really the story of the day, unfortunately, is the big accident which uh, uh, befell on uh, Ayrton Senna coming out of one of the high speed turns. He uh, shut off the circuit and went straight into a concrete wall. I'm very pleased to say to you that uh, although slightly concussed and uh, his, I think, left leg is real badly bruised, uh, hopefully he'll be back driving in the car maybe sometime tomorrow, but a very big accident and uh, the actual time practice was delayed for about 20 minutes due to this accident. Of course, Ayrton um, had a crash here last year. Yeah, in the Peralta, um, Ayrton actually rolled it last year, going on a, a very, very quick lap. And But uh, I think that this accident today was uh, even surpassed the one that he had here last year. So, is the circuit dangerous? Well, the problem with this particular circuit is the fact that um, uh, it's built on a, a lake bed, as we're aware. The circuit actually changes from year to year from the point of view that you know, one part of the circuit last year might have been smooth, and this year is, in fact, there's, there's a, almost a small hill there. And uh, so, indicatively, it's bumpy, it's fast. And then you've got the other problems that, obviously, uh, and I'm, I'm not proud to tell you this, but it's a, a first, apparently, there's the most pollution in Mexico City in the history of Mexico today at 12 o'clock. And how this affects is that the dust and the pollution comes down on the circuit like dust, and it changes the circuit from lap to lap sometimes. And um, it just makes it very, very tricky. Well, what we'll do is uh, take you on a qualifying lap around the uh, Mexico City circuit. Uh, we obviously come out the Peralta as quickly as possible. You're actually exiting and coming across uh, the start and finish line doing 275 kilometers an hour. You are literally changing from fifth gear to sixth gear right on the start finish line. Remaining in sixth all the way down the straight is a little bit bumpy, but from here to here is the only time that you can actually breathe properly on this circuit. So once you get down to here, which is the 100 meter board, you actually are braking quite hard and going from sixth to fifth to fourth to third. And you're turning into the corner here as tight as one can, and then going through the S's and making a straight line as, as much as possible. Now in the middle of this corner, it's not as straightforward as you think because you have cambers on the side of the road. So if the road is like this, there's the middle of the road, the camber actually falls off. So it is quite difficult to get the car balanced. And literally on the exit here, still in third, you change to fourth and fifth. And sometimes you get it into sixth gear before here very bumpy through here and this is getting quicker all the time we are now up to about 210 kilometers an hour and this there's a massive bump right here where I put this cross and unfortunately today in qualifying the McLaren with Ayrton Senna came through here hit the bump the car went sideways on the circuit spun and then there's a concrete wall just about here and he came straight in spun around and hit into the wall and it was a very, very high speed shunt and the deacceleration, I'd say, probably only slowed down to 180 before he hit the wall. And it was a very, very big accident. You win and lose races <coughs> in Mexico depending how quick you approach this corner and how, pitch, how, how quick you are through the corner. And unless you have the car set up where you are competitive, then you'll never be able to pass anybody on this circuit because from here all the way around the circuit until here, is impossible to pass unless someone makes a mistake. So this corner is the key to winning the race here on Sunday. And we are fortunately at the moment the quickest car at 275. And then if you do everything right and you don't make any mistakes, you are able to go around in one minute 16.3 seconds, which just happens to be coincidentally today first position pole and fortunately I'm pleased to say that I managed to do that lap. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the lap of the Mexican Grand Prix. Saturday morning early. 
the mechanics, press and allied members of the Grand Prix Circus congregate for breakfast. Traditional bacon and eggs, continental choice, or for the more adventurous, a medley of Mexican morsels. The hotel is completely taken over by the Grand Prix personnel during race week. The occasional misplaced businessman always looks surprised by droves of uniform-clad team members congregating in the lobby. Most set off for the circuit at virtually the same time, causing chaos for the garage attendants and necessitating an impatient wait for all. Once qualifying is underway, Gerhard Berger becomes the latest casualty of a spin at the Peralta curve. Nigel's teammate, Patrese, is fractionally quicker today, but no one improves on Nigel's time set yesterday, so he retains pole position with Patrese next on the grid. What happened with the race car this morning? Well, we, um, we had a few problems with the computers and um, the engine power went down this morning. There was a problem with it which we couldn't really identify and time was against us. It takes two hours to change the engine and uh, it was deemed that the backup car should be uh, pretty close to it. So rather than sort of make everybody panic and change an engine quickly, uh, we decided just to use the backup car. And this afternoon? Uh this afternoon uh, we pushed very hard. I did the second quickest time this afternoon to my teammate, um, but it wasn't a good afternoon. There was lots of problems, lots of accidents. Um, I'd say somewhere in the region of about 12 people went off having accidents, and uh, I'm just pleased that now uh, the race day comes tomorrow. Can you talk us through the, uh, the front six on the grid tomorrow? Um, obviously, uh, front row is great for the Renault Williams team, uh, Canon Renault Williams team, because uh, I'm on pole, Ricardo Patrese and my teammates on uh, the front row with me. Then in third place we have uh, the young hotshot Michael Schumacher, the German driver for Benetton. Then his teammate uh, Martin Brundle again from England, so that's very good for Martin, uh, in fourth place. And then Miss Gerhard Berger and uh, Etten Senna, five and six. And the plan? <sighs> Try and go out and win and stay there. Hi oh, Rudy. 7 a.m. on Sunday morning, and Nigel's leaving for the circuit one last time. He seems relaxed. Will this be his day? With five hours to go to the start, the fans are arriving, and the tension is beginning to mount. lap draws to a close. Mansell leads after one lap ahead of teammate Patrese. It's the end of a bad week for the champion Ayrton Senna. He recovered from his accident only to be ruled out by mechanical failure. And it's another spectacular green light to chequered flag victory for Nigel Mansell and a Williams 1-2 as in South Africa. Schumacher on the rostrum for the first but certainly not the last time. Two races, two victories, and two second places put the Williams drivers out ahead in the championship table. In the constructors' table, an emphatic lead for Williams-Renault, with McLaren trailing with nine, Bennett on seven, and Tyrrell and Lotus on two points. No sign yet of the red Ferraris. Many congratulations, Nigel. Nice trophy. <laughs> yes, uh, it's wonderful. It's a bit too early for it to all sink in at the moment, but... Very, very hard race. My teammate Ricardo Patrese drove uh, an excellent race and was <coughs> pushing real hard for about 30 laps. But, uh, I mean, we got the result that we wanted, so uh, I'm very, very comfortable with that. And once again, you showed a clean pair of wheels to the rest of the field? Well, I guess we did, but it wasn't as easy as it probably looked. Um, I mean, uh, but the engine worked real good and I didn't really have any problems other than the car was very difficult to drive at the end. It was very harsh over the bumps. But when you win, you got to smile. Um, any hairy moments at all? Yeah, the start, uh, the first corner was quite hairy. I got out of shape going around the first corner. 
big oversteer, but um, after that I just kept everything uh, in sync. Another terrific one too for the team Williams. They must be delighted. Fabulous. I mean, the Williams team have done a fantastic job as of Renault and uh, the Al Fuel, and of course, you know, uh, Canon and associated sponsors, Canon, Camel. I mean, just wonderful. Great, great team effort. Labatt's will be drinking some of their beer maybe tomorrow. So, real happy. A delighted Nigel and his wife Roseanne board their plane bound for Florida with yet another magnificent trophy to add to their collection. When you fly down to Rio, keep going for another 400 kilometers and you'll arrive in Sao Paulo, Brazil's biggest city. With a population of around 15 million, it rivals only Mexico City as the fastest growing place on Earth. Covering more than 95,000 square miles, Sao Paulo state is about the size of Great Britain. And it's the location for the third round of the Formula One World Drivers' Championship. The 90-year-old Sao Paulo Golf Club is an oasis in the middle of a teeming city and it's the first port of call for Nigel the morning after his arrival from Florida. Well, here we are again. I mean, we're at the third round now. What can one say after South Africa, after Mexico? Welcome to Brazil. Here we are in Sao Paulo. We're currently walking the golf course on the first hole. I must say that the first time I've actually been to San Paolo that we have dry weather so I think it's great to actually come out on the golf course and, and to sort of get some fresh air and a little bit of sunlight and it's the quickest way for me to acclimate. We are currently at about 11 o'clock on Thursday, the day before um, obviously practice starts and what I'll do as the day goes on is, is talk you through how I feel the season's gone so far the challenges of this weekend and I think it's quite astonishing because uh, all credit must be given to sort of Honda and McLaren because they actually have would you believe six cars here and uh, that's quite astonishing anyway we'll go and have a look at uh, where the balls just landed and we'll play the second shot That'll be uh, putt for birdie. Putt for birdie. Yeah. Put for birdie. Oh, Nigel, you, what's your key thought on on golf when you're facing the ball up there? Do you think swing or do you think? Yeah, swing. I think I think the biggest thing is, I mean, one of these days I'm going to get really serious on golf. But I can't get serious on golf. You're going to play Yeah. Until I finish with racing, because with racing. You have to have the mentality that you have to be the quickest on the circuit. You're always trying to go faster, faster, faster. And in golf, really it's the complete opposite. You have to try and slow down and try to focus on, just like we are now, we're talking between shots now. I have time to think about the shot and then maybe only 10 seconds to execute it. Whereas with driving, you are all the time like this, and your arms are like this, holding onto the wheel and racing around. So when I finish with racing, which I don't know will be, then I'll concentrate very hard on golf for maybe one or two years and see how, see how good I can get. Right. Do you think that's why you like it so much, because of the contrast and the speed so. of the two? I think if you can apply yourself over three or four hours of playing golf, it's actually good training then also for for the car. Let's see if we can stick this one by the flag. Be the right club. Be the right club. Oh! 
Look how much it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing when you reflect on uh, the previous year. You obviously try and learn from your experiences, but it's got to be said that uh, last year, I actually said before the uh, season started that we had a new engine, a new car, a new transmission and gearbox, and uh, you shouldn't really expect too much for the first three or four races. They were basically wild cards. And... Um, Unfortunately, that proved exactly correct because of the reliability problems. And here we are, 12 months on, and you know we have two wins under our belt, and we're coming into San Paolo now as certainly one of the favourites for Sunday. And you basically get quietly confident that at least you know, hopefully, the car will be as reliable as it has been in the previous two races. But you never once get uh, complacent in any way at all. And therefore, uh, as soon as I finish playing golf here this morning, I'll be going to see my race engineer, David Brown. We have an awful lot of aerodynamic uh, settings to go through. We have a lot of uh, computer strategies to actually examine and uh, probably change the software. And there's a lot of bump damping on the uh, car to be changed from Mexico. And we're going to have a look at all the graphs. And then, of course, we're going to walk the circuit and just make sure that the circuit is as it was here last year. And uh, then we've really got to trust the good Lord upstairs and, and all the engineers and mechanics to hopefully put the car together as well as they have done previously. And we get straight into uh, the normal routine of Friday morning qualifying, uh, 10 to 11.30, free practice, and 1 till 2 o'clock, as you know, official qualifying. And uh, we're literally um, probably about 18 hours away from uh, the first time we step in the car to, uh, to go out on the grid here. see this road come Sunday for people. Meanwhile, back at the Transamerica Hotel, the base this week for Nigel and many of the other drivers, there's time for some to relax. There's an exhibition of racing paintings here to coincide with Grand Prix week. And it's a subject close to Nigel's own heart. Well, Nigel, sitting here in, in your rather splendid study, there must be a few memories in uh, the paintings behind you. Yeah, they're great uh, originals. Um, there's special editions done of them, prints. And part of my deal is is that if I do do uh, the signatures on the uh, on the prints, that I get the original painting. And the one over here on the right uh, behind me is uh, the 1989 Grand Prix, the first race I drove for Ferrari which was very historical because we won the race in Rio, in Brazil, and uh, there's only two drivers ever have done that in the history of the whole Ferrari team. So, uh, I mean, uh, that was very, very satisfying. And uh, then, of course, this one here, which is Brands Hatch, which was another great victory uh, in 1986. And then this one here, which was the phenomenal uh, duel between Ayrton and myself in Hungary, and that was the overtaking manoeuvre there. And then the one on the uh, far left is uh, the victory that we had in Hockenheim, Germany. So, I mean, all great victories, uh, all different countries, and fantastic memories. Maybe Brazil 1992 will hold fantastic memories again for Nigel, racing his rival Ayrton Senna on his home territory. Friday morning, outside the Transamerica, and time to go to work. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, obviously Friday. It's now uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, and we're leaving uh, for the San Paolo circuit. 
I must confess I'm a little late getting up this morning. I had a problem getting out of bed, but uh, in some ways that's a good sign. We're straight into it today. Uh, as you can see, the weather is absolutely splendid. So we shouldn't have any rain until late this afternoon, if at all. Just to reiterate the schedule this morning, uh, I take about half an hour from here now to get to the circuit, so I'll be arriving there about 8.30, have a little bit of breakfast, sit down with my engineer and go through the schedule of the day. And then, of course, uh, we have a free practice from 10 to 11.30, and then official practice from 1 till 2. And uh, you might catch some of that, but if not, I'll hopefully catch up with you on the golf course at about 4 o'clock this afternoon. See you then. Brazilians are so fanatical for racing, they'll go anywhere for a view of the action, even if it's the top of the city's refuse mountain. Provisional pole, once again for Nigel, smells much sweeter. And there's no sign either of Senna in his new Space Age McLaren MP47A. Well, here we are again at uh, the San Paulo Golf Club, uh, which is about 20 minutes away from the racetrack. Uh, obviously one of my favourite spots. It's been an absolutely scintillating and fantastic day. It really has. The Renault engines work tremendously well. Uh, the Williams car. I mean, the whole package, uh, the L fuel, we had some new fuel today, which obviously uh, contributed to the lap time too. And we put uh, a real good lap, I'd say. One of my career best laps for qualifying today. I ended up 1.8 seconds quicker than my teammate. And he was in turn a second quicker uh, than the rest of the... Uh, Competitor, so I mean, absolutely fantastic day for the team. Uh, nice and relaxed now, a bit tired, but uh, we're going to play a few holes of golf and uh, get ready for this evening. I'm inviting you to come with me this evening now to uh, an actual one of the functions we're going to do, and uh, you'll see a lot of entertainment tonight and probably a lot of pretty girls. So uh, follow us around the golf course for a few holes and then come with us this evening. party time for some of the drivers and team members. There are some duties to perform, but it's also a chance to mix, relax or chat, away from the pressures of the circuit. And there's the occasional reminder of Team Williams' favourite fuel supplier. The drivers have to excuse themselves early to be ready for the rigours of final qualifying tomorrow, while others just party on into the night. The weather conditions today are not quite as good as yesterday. Uh, the track could be a little bit quicker because it was very hot yesterday and the engine will have a little bit more power today, but uh, we'll have to wait and see and uh, certainly I'll be speaking to you later, so... Uh, you go and visit the city and uh, I'll catch up with you later. Bye -bye. Down to Sao Paulo's central district. The Anhangabao Valley used to be a free-flowing river. Now it's home to some spectacular skyscrapers and breathtaking 100-foot palm trees. Disaster at the track during qualifying. A high-speed shunt with Ayrton Senna sees Nigel collide heavily with a concrete wall. Although in shock, he appears to be well. He's helicoptered back to the hotel under doctor's orders. Once there, he's spirited away by security men through a series of secret passages and corridors to avoid the waiting media. Hey, Mr. Then he tells us what happened. 
Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm ready to get a nice hot bath and <coughs> I'm ready to go to bed. Um, obviously you saw on television what happened. It was uh, quite a big accident. I don't blame Ayrton really uh, for the accident at all. It was a uh, miscommunication because he called me through and I thought he was going to let me pass. And, and then uh, I don't know what happened but uh, we ran out of road anyway. So. Uh, we had a half spin and then hit the wall. It's probably the only place on the circuit where there's a wall so close. Uh, but I could have done without it. So as we're speaking, there's no certainty that, that you will race tomorrow at this stage? You can take it from me that I'll race tomorrow, but uh, obviously not in as good condition as I want to be. Can McLaren Honda break the Williams team's stranglehold? Will Nigel be fully recovered from his crash at Cotovelo? Avenida Interlagos on race day gets busy before the drivers are even away from their hotels. What's the procedure now for the rest of the morning when you get there? Is there a medical examination? Yeah, I've got to go and pass my uh, medical now. And uh, hopefully that will be plain sailing. I'll put on a good brave sweat face, so that'll be quite good. And then, uh, and then get into the business, warm up at half past eight, which is real early. But uh, as I said, we'll probably be all right. We'll have a, hopefully a great day. I'll speak to you later. As Nigel headed off for his medical, for the others, it's all to the race circuit by more conventional methods of transport. Michael Schumacher for Benetton. The Williams team manager, Peter Windsor, wonders what today will hold. Lotus drivers Mika Hakkinen left and Johnny Herbert in the centre. Nicky Lauda, now seconded to help struggling Ferrari, leaves with the French driver Jean Alessi back left. Williams designer Patrick Head hopes Nigel's rebuilt car will prove to be successful. Susie Patrese and Ricardo seem in relaxed mood. And among the last to leave, McLaren's Gerhard Berger. There's no doubting that the Brazilians want their own hero Senna to win today. The people continue to flock as time trickles away. You're hard pressed to find a supporter waving anything other than Brazilian flags. But Mansell fans are here, if you look carefully enough. Drama right at the start for Nigel as he spins his wheels and loses the lead to Patrese. Senna's race is run on lap 17. Nigel's pit stop on lap 29 is faster than Patrese's and it's enough to give Nigel the lead. He goes from strength to strength to take the flag. It's three wins in a row for Nigel, his 24th victory, equaling the record of the legendary Juan Manuel Fangio. Fantastic, isn't it? I mean, I can't really believe it. It's just... Uh... The team's been done a marvellous job. I mean, the engine works superbly today, and I mean, my teammate, poor dear, he drove like a, a man possessed for the first half of the race. It was really tough to uh, try and get past, but the pit stop was very, very good, and uh, then I came out and did a couple of qualifying laps to get uh, the jump on him on the pit stop, and then I managed to pull away steadily then after that, which was nice. <laughs> Just tell us, I mean, after hitting a brick wall at 151 day, how can you go out and win the Grand Prix the next? Oh, it's what is known as uh, dedication, I guess, but I mean, I ache and I hurt now, and I shall hurt even more tomorrow, so, you know, but it's all credit to the team. Uh, the team have done so well, and I'm real happy to have won here today. Nigel is way ahead of the field with a maximum 30 points, leading his teammate Patrese, who's on 18, Schumacher on 11, Austria's Gerhard Berger totaling five, Maximum points then for the delighted Williams Renault team, leading Benetton Ford by 37 points. Come on, Nigel, welcome back to the English Spring. It's incredible, isn't it? Now I know why I went to winter in Florida. I mean, it's definitely a good call. Tell us a little bit about how testing's gone today. Well, we've had a great day. We've done a lot of uh, comparison work, although it's been very uh, blustery. We've had up to sort of winds of 50 or 60 miles an hour. 
but uh, the car's ran reliable and uh, we're very pleased with it. The times are quicker than last year already, quicker than qualifying, so we've gone about a second quicker than uh, than anyone's ever gone here before and being as I was the person who went the quickest time before, that's nice. Um, quite a good day, but I just hope the weather picks up and it's a little bit better tomorrow. Are you testing anything top secret or...? Yeah, we've got a new engine, RS4, which is functioning very, very well and um, it's very encouraging, has a little bit more power. The response is quite good, but there's still a long way to go yet to sort of get it perfect. Olympics host Barcelona is the venue for round four. The stadium that was originally constructed for the Olympic Games in 1936 was sadly not used because of the Spanish Civil War. But it's been refurbished for its duties this summer, and long before the Games it proves to be a popular tourist attraction. Within the stadium's shadow, some aspiring racers battle to control their model cars. Scenes no doubt to be reenacted for real this weekend at the circuit at Catalunya. Hard work for the mechanics in these pits as well. On his first day in Spain, however, Nigel Mansell's not to be found at the circuit. Scenery of a different sort appeals to him, and it's not difficult to see why. The peace and tranquility of the Club de Golf Val Romanas. But before Nigel can enjoy the beauty this golf course has to offer, duty calls again in the shape of the BBC stalwart race commentator Murray Walker. Another race looming, another interview to be negotiated. I think the fabulous thing is I can have a shorter interview with you without being interrupted. <laughs> That's a real plus. <laughs> without the noise. <laughs> That's a big plus. I can get rid of it quick. But um, no, I mean, it's condition of the mind. One thing I've learned is that there's only one person that knows the condition of your body and your mind, and that's yourself. And a lot of us don't listen to it. And therefore, uh, I've learned this winter as well with the objectives I try to sort of uh, accomplish. Now, I've got to listen to myself more. And this is space. No phones, no noise, no smell of engines, not too many reporters. Our people are very pleasant and accommodating. And to get out on that golf course and whack the ball is great. I've just noticed you're getting a small fraction, isn't that? Yeah. He's <laughs> <laughs> getting me back. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. Here we are in Spain, Barcelona, a glorious sunny day. We're at a track where last year there was a, an incredible amount of excitement, uh, mainly because of the weather conditions. It started wet, then it dried off, then it started to rain again. There was exceptional excitement in the pit lane where wheels were being changed from wet tires to dry tires. But here we are, and I'm glad to say that the uh, sunshine's coming down on us and it's very, very pleasant. The golf course, splendid, isn't it?
bloody course. So what do you reckon for the weekend, what we should do then? Well, I'll give you my game plan tomorrow. Up again, really at the crack of dawn, probably half past six. Shower, seven. Seven for 7.30, breakfast. And I'm going to be at the track probably for eight o'clock in the morning tomorrow. Why? Because we have had this break from San Paolo of three to four weeks. Everybody will be well fired up tomorrow and I've got to make sure that both my cars are set up extremely well. I've got to get my mechanics motivated, not that they're not already, but just give them that little bit of an edge. Have a real good briefing with the engineer. And of course, I mean, this weekend's quite an exceptional weekend because our team's going to be running for the first time this year four cars. Yes, that's right, unfortunately, my teammate has got a spare car of his own all this weekend. And then uh, that will basically eliminate all the dramas that we had in San Paolo with him borrowing my spare car, etc., etc. So, a lot of work to be done. Crack a sparrow, we call it, in the morning. But uh, I want to be quick, straight off the bat. So, I predict that uh, hopefully within half a dozen laps we'll be at the top of the time board. And, and then we'll have to work very, very hard to maintain that this weekend. Friday morning, and Nigel goes to work immediately at the Circuit de Catalunya to be more than a second quicker in setting provisional pole at 1 minute 20.19 seconds. Good day at the office, was it? Yeah, another great day. Uh, not exactly as, uh, as we had hoped, though. Uh, my teammate, unfortunately, is in fourth position. Uh, been a lot of excitement there at the circuit today. A lot of cars spinning off, which we might be able to see some of the footage later. But the track um, hasn't rubbered in at all. It's, it's very green, as we call it, and there's no grip on any particular corner. It makes life very, very difficult indeed to obviously try and go as quickly as one can. Great day, though, for me again. We're, we're on pole position by just one second, and uh, that might sound uh, quite good, but really, with the problems we had, uh, I'd be a lot more comfortable if that margin was a bit more. Saturday morning, and the weather hasn't been fixed. The storm clouds have opened. We're literally leaving now because we've got to obviously have different briefings this morning because in the rain we have to change the cars a lot. This will be in fact the first practice we've probably really had in the active car at all in the rain and it's certainly the first race for some time other than uh, the last race of last year that we've uh, done in the rain this year. And also the first test really that we've had in the rain. So uh, I'm afraid it's to work again. We'll catch up with you later. The rain in Spain that day was relentless, making driving unpleasant for mere mortals, let alone Formula One drivers. Friday's practice time stood, leaving Nigel in pole position for the race. But the rain robbed him of another chance to relax. A waterlogged course meant that golf at Val Romanas was definitely off the agenda. Saturday in Barcelona was a complete washout. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was going to go and hit some golf balls this afternoon and we didn't have time to do that because uh, we've just been uh, trying to find a compromise with the car set up because uh, it could be wet tomorrow and it could be dry. And it's been uh, quite an exciting day. Uh, I think there's been something like about 30 or 40 accidents with cars going off all over the place. And I was unfortunately one of them, but no serious damage. But um, it's been a very, very tiring and a very long day. Coming down the track very quickly in six, braking very hard at this point from six to fifth to fourth to third and sometimes even down to second gear. A quick squ squirt in second, third and then fourth gear, staying in fourth gear and then before this corner actually getting in fifth. And this corner is 266 kilometers an hour. Very fast corner and you're actually pulling something like about 4.8 G lateral. So a lot of G-force being forced both ways here. Very, very stressful corner. If anyone said to me, which corner wins or loses the race here? And this is it, this corner right here. Why? The exit speed of this corner is going to determine your terminal speed down this straight. 
This is the only place on this circuit where you can overtake from here to basically here is impossible to overtake anybody unless of course they make a mistake and not many of them do unfortunately so you've got to be very quick onto this straight and obviously be one of the quickest cars down the straight if you can do all that and you put a perfect lap together you can do one minute point twenty point one this weekend and I'm very pleased to tell you that I managed to do it so we have our fourth consecutive pole position here in Spain race day dawns and the weather hasn't improved I think you can sort of have a pan round, have a look at the sky it doesn't exactly feel you full of confidence um, it's never nice to get up on a Sunday morning and, uh, and know that you're going to have a race <laughs> whereby it's going to be a little bit of a lottery and uh, the elements are going to play a very large part in uh, the outcome of the race today even if you get a good start, which obviously I'm hoping to get a good start. Within 10 or 15 laps, you'll be coming there to lap the back markers. And in these conditions, not one driver will be able to see behind him because of the spray, the plumes of spray. And therefore, overtaking uh, even slow cars is going to be uh, very, very difficult. Among the last to leave for the circuit is team boss Frank Williams. Time for a lightning quick tour of Barcelona's magnificent architecture. The stalwarts brave the rain and head for the track now, but even parking's affected by yesterday's downpour. In appalling conditions, Patrese's race is run early when he hits a wall. Ayrton Senna is another casualty, and after a defiant battle in the rain, Nigel Mansell makes it four straight wins from four starts, the first Briton to do so. Schumacher followed by Alessi, Berger, Alboreto and Martini. Nigel has a maximum 40 points in the Drivers' Championship now. Teammate Patrese stays on 18, hard pressed by Schumacher. Senna languishes on four points. The Williams team are still miles ahead in the Constructors' Championship. No competition apart from Benetton up to now. We caught up with Nigel at Hirona Airport. Four in a row, and Jim Clark's 25 now. I know, it's unbelievable, and I don't know whether you, it's probably silly to say, I don't know whether you saw the race, because you probably did, but it was catastrophic, I mean, the weather, the rain, my eyes feel as though they're out the sockets because you're straining to see all the time where you're going, the car was on tender hooks all the time, but heck, we won, what can you say? Except I don't think it will sink in till tomorrow. I mean, the activity and work and all the rest of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's just phenomenal. Still speechless, really. Out of breath, tired, ready to go to bed. And, you know, I'm ready to take off, to be honest. And the team, uh, the Ricardo had a spin there, so he yeah, scored the 1-2 sure. record. Uh, Ricardo had a problem, uh, but I mean, so did so many other drivers. I mean, any driver that finished that race there today deserves a medal. No question of it. I'll probably see you in a few weeks' time at Imola. In the meantime, I don't know whether it's doing this film work or not, but four in a row, I can't say any more. You better keep the good uh, act going for the next one. Thank you very much.
As the enormity of equaling Jim Clark's 25 wins sinks in, a tired but elated Nigel is sped back to the Isle of Man, where he'll be based for the remaining European races. San Marino, Europe's smallest republic, lies in the eastern hills of the Apennines. The republic's breathtaking panoramas draw three and a half million tourists a year, more than 150 to each inhabitant. San Marino is host to round five of the Formula One World Championship, though the only clue to this is the occasional Ferrari flag. But the raucous roaring doesn't disturb this tiny fortified capital. 70 miles further northwest brings you closer to the Formula One action. Imola, founded in the second century by the Romans, actually hosts San Marino's Grand Prix. And Nigel Mansell is looking to make history with five wins in a row. Good morning to you all. Welcome to the sunshine. Uh, it's pleasant to be here in Italy. We're at the San Marino Grand Prix. We're just leaving the hotel here on the first day. It's Friday morning and it's quite early this morning, 7.30. But you can see it's an absolutely glorious day and I think you'll be going around uh, certain places close to uh, this track. And uh, I'll be visiting with you this afternoon to let you know how this morning's got on. So we'll catch up with you then. Bologna is the capital of this northern part of Italy, and its chief landmarks are the twin leaning towers, survivors of more than 200 fortresses that once stood here. Climbing its 498 stairs could cause cardiac arrest, but it's probably well worth the risk. 15 minutes, including resting time, just about gets you to the top. <laughs> <laughs> the regimentation of the Roman architects is the most striking aspect from this bird's eye vantage point. This vine clad northern part of Italy is home too to another famous name, revered and treasured more than Pasta and Chianti, that of Ferrari and its tradition of blood-red racers. The Ferrari factory is based northwest of Bologna in Maranello. When Nigel spent two years of his racing life here from 1989, Italy opened its arms to him and the nation its hearts. Well, I mean, uh... The fans here are just second to none anywhere in the world. The Tifosi as they're uh, renowned. I think uh, working for a Ferrari for two years obviously uh, endeared uh, them to me and vice versa. And uh, we share a great sense of enthusiasm for racing. And it's exactly that tenacity which prompted Team Williams to entice Nigel away from Ferrari in 1991. Commercial director Sheridan Thin explains the qualities that drew them back to their ex-driver. Oh, his enduring, unfailing determination, no matter what the adversity, his absolute commitment to performance all the time, and his sheer raw enthusiasm for all that's best in racing. And we'd known that for the four years he worked with us before, and we wanted to get back to that sort of level. I just admire enormously the drivers in those little cockpits. I don't know how they control the car. I never, I'll go to my grave never really knowing what goes on in there. Uh, but I think what they do, I, that, that's what I love about motor racing, what the drivers do in the racing cars, to hang it right out. And Nigel was hanging it right out there as usual in Friday's first qualifying at Imola, with a scorching lap of 121.8. Well, we're very pleased with today. I mean, today was a very special lap again, similar to the lap we did in uh, Brazil. Um, but it was more special because um, I did it in my race car, not my qualifying car. Because my teammate had to have the qualifying car because he had problems with his race car. So it's a bit like musical chairs and uh, the best engine wasn't in the race car because that was the engine for doing the homework for race condition tomorrow. So, I mean, we were, we were really delighted. I mean, it was a great day today and, uh, I mean, hopefully we'll have a better one tomorrow. And Tim McLaren's uh, behind you there. Yeah, I mean, they're closing the gap. the gap, no question. They'll go quicker tomorrow too. 
so I mean, uh, you know, it's not over yet, and of course we've got the big day to come yet on Sunday. Nigel had an extra adversary this weekend. The pollen count here is quite horrendous, and unfortunately I suffer with uh, a few allergies, and uh, certainly, um, as you can hear, it's affecting my throat. Fortunately, my eyes are clear, but um, I've got to be very careful tomorrow to uh, stay out of as, as much pollen as I can. Italians take their motor racing seriously, as you can see. For every thousand inside the circuit, there's a thousand outside, with a thousand ways to glimpse the action. They build scaffold rigs around the circus perimeter, come for the week, park their campers in orderly row, and generally have a good time. Naturally, the Ferrari fans are en masse here, but hospitality is the keynote, and it doesn't matter who you support. <laughs> <laughs> they don't miss a lap and time luncheon between sessions. Second qualifying came and went. Nobody could beat Nigel's time from the previous day, and Ricardo duly obliged with second place. But did having an Italian teammate in Italy add any pressure? Well, I mean, I'm delighted to obviously be on pole position that qualified him because um, he is well and truly fired up. This is his home Grand Prix. And, um, you know, obviously it's very satisfying to still remain on pole. But there's no question that Ricardo will be driving as hard as he certainly knows how to try and win the race in his own country tomorrow. In fact, in a poll in the newspapers, apparently this week, um, of all-time favourite Ferrari drivers, I think you feature fourth, which isn't bad considering you've not driven for them for two years, is it? It's very difficult to pass any comment on anything like that, but uh, I think with the amount of drivers that have driven for Ferrari and the fact that I'm English, I take that as uh, being in the top ten, I think, is uh, a big compliment. No, Ricardo had a, um, an accident in testing uh, the other week. And your former teammate, Nelson Piquet, in the Indy 500 series had a nasty accident just last week. Do you think people may be pushing the limits too much? Well, I mean, it's a strange question, number one, but I'll try and answer it. Motor racing, in one word, is dangerous. If you get into any vehicle that does more than 30 miles an hour, and you hit a concrete wall, 
likelihood that you're going to get hurt or shook up pretty bad. So, I mean, uh, I can't say any more than that, other than the fact that we're all professionals. Uh, we all push the limits, but, you know, sometimes cars do things to you that you can't control. Mechanical failure or you run over something on the road. You know, it's a risk you take if you're going to be a race car driver, and you just hope that you play the percentages and you try and stay out of trouble. Now, fasten your seatbelts for a guided tour around the circuit with the man in pole position. Okay, nice qualifying lap out of uh, this corner here, which is the tight chicane onto the start and finish line in second gear. Accelerating up very quickly, third, fourth, and fifth gear. And the start and finish line is here, and you're actually doing 260 kilometers an hour at this point here. You change up to sixth here, and you flat out in sixth through the Tamburello. And then you come down the straight here towards the Villeneuve curve, and at this point here, you are doing 332 kilometers an hour, or 204 miles per hour. And now you have a very important part of the circuit. Accelerating fourth, fifth, sixth, just before this kink. And the actual track is going downhill. It's a very steep hill down here. You're having to brake very hard. Sixth, fifth, fourth, third, second. Second there, quick squirt to third, round here in third, exiting fourth, up to fifth. And this is a very quick corner coming back into the stadium. Change down to fourth, accelerating all the way, hitting the rev limiter about here. And then down to third, down to second, accelerating through the chicane. If you get this lap perfect, the actual pole position time is 1 minute 21.8 seconds. And my teammate is 122.8 in second place. It just so happens that I'm very pleased to tell you that I have pole position again. But the most important corners on this track is this one here, coming onto the main straight, and then your top speed, your top speed down this straight is very important for overtaking. So this corner here, the speed on the start and finish line, and then this is where all the main overtaking will be done tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's wonderful to wake up and, and know that uh, we're going to the racetrack for a dry race, hopefully. I mean, looking in the sky, I don't think I'm uh, tempting fate this morning, but uh, obviously after the Spanish one, I'm delighted. Uh, the hay fever, you can probably still see, still quite bad. Uh, one of the toughest things today is to breathe properly. But um, again, as you know, starting from pole position, I'm fairly fired up. Um, I'm going to the track now to have an early breakfast, and then I'm going to try and get an hour of sleep before warm up this morning. The reason I got up so early to uh, go to the circuit is because the traffic now is going to be horrendous in about half an hour's time. So I'd rather get to the circuit early, have a lot of rest, and no aggravation. So uh, I'm saying that. We'll hopefully see you at Forley uh, a little bit later after the race. You'll be seeing how it's going, and we'll tell you exactly uh, what's happened through the race then. Have a good one. See ya. Bye. Everyone who had a ticket was inside by now, but last minute preparations were in hand for those who hadn't. Restaurants were deserted as race time chimed. Nigel and Ricardo get a dream start. Senna clear through, 
but disaster befalls Alessi and Gerhard Berger as they collide. Nigel streaks ahead to take the chequered flag and makes history. The only man to win the first five races in a Formula One season. Senna, third, was left exhausted, unable to get out of the cockpit after the heat of the race. A perfect 50 points from five starts then, and a healthy gap to Patrese in the Drivers' Championship. And I made history. First five races in the Formula One Championship. Ever in the history. Oh boy, I tell you, it's incredible. I'm tired, but I'm happy. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, uh, you, you said to us in South Africa that plan one was to win the first race. Plan two, obviously, was to win the second, and here we are, five down the line. I know. I don't know what to say. What about Except, plan 16? Oh, no, I don't know. No, no. <laughs> Let's take one race at a time. This one's history now. Obviously, been a fabulous day. Um, one of the greatest in my life, there's no question. To think that you've created history today in the whole sport to winning obviously five in a row from the beginning of the season. It puts you amongst the greats of all time. But it's a tribute, and I must say it's a tribute to the team, uh, to all the Renault engineers and designers, to the Williams team especially, uh, all the mechanics, everybody back at the factory, the associated sponsors to Elf, the fuel supplier. I mean, uh, Without them, we'd do nothing. And so this race, this little bit of history we made today, is a big tribute to all of them. In the joy of victory, we leave him to ponder on the fairy tale season so far. A delighted Nigel on top of the world. And Serenity returns to San Marino. Monte Carlo, jewel of the Mediterranean and playground of the high rollers. The stunning Beach Plaza Hotel is one of hundreds of five-star hotels here and it's home this week to many of the drivers, including Nigel. There's time to relax this race week reunited at last with his wife Razan and their three children, even if the Mansell's second son Greg is proving a little camera shy. Hi everybody, well here we are in Monte Carlo, the uh, sixth round of the Grand Prix season. I think you can see with uh, the scenery it's a little bit better uh, venue. I'm here with my family, my wife Razan and my three children, uh, Chloe who's uh, age nine, who's ten in August. Leo, who's seven and uh, will be eight. Where are you, Leo? Oh, he's, he's gone a running now. Oh, there he is, he's hiding. <laughs> and, uh, of course, Greg, uh, the terror, which uh, is hiding on the, on the ground there, and he's uh, just four. And, of course, our nanny Claire. In the heat of the afternoon, before qualifying, it's time to take the plunge. <laughs> The quiet mountainside above the Bay of Monte Carlo, but not for long as Thursday's qualifying session begins. Hairpin bends up the mountain are as severe as those on the race circuit. Nigel sets the pace, quickest again for the sixth Grand Prix in a row. It looked a bit touch and go at one time, but Senna was overtaking you. In... Yeah, I mean, for the first uh, 40 minutes, I was uh, P2, I was P1 for the first 20 minutes, and then P2 for the next 20 minutes and then uh, obviously we managed to get a lap together and uh, with relatively little traffic and we managed to get P1 back which was very nice. And any problems with the car at all? Yeah, the car is uh, very tricky to drive around here. <coughs> there's no margin for error and there's you know walls and barriers everywhere. Uh, they've relayed some of the circuit which uh, makes it uh, nice on some corners and more difficult on others because where the new surface stops the old surface starts and it uh, makes it more slippery just because of that i mean the active mm. ride has proved itself quite well up to now is, is this street circuit going to be a this major is, test this is the major test this is the biggest test of the year and uh, i mean at the moment although we've had a few problems when you've had a few problems and we're still on provisional pole it's it's quite nice 
I know at home, certainly in England, there was a lot of newspaper talk suggesting possible rule changes to try and stop perhaps Williams you know, making a, a run. You know, it's a package, and, and where were these people who was going to say these things for the last four years? And the reason they didn't say it the last four years is that there were McLaren, Honda, Ayrton, Senna supporters. And because they're not supporters of the Williams team and Renault and, and Nigel Mansell, they're saying all these things now. So I don't feel hurt. I just think that uh, sometimes uh, they shouldn't get the publicity that they get. You know, and uh, why these things. And Jackie Stewart did a fantastic article in the paper just recently and actually said that Ayrton Senna had this advantage the last four years. What's wrong with me having a slight advantage now? He's had it for four years. I've had it for five races. You know, and uh, I mean, Jack is absolutely right. You don't win world championships and you can't do the job you do unless the whole package is there. And, you know, why should our team be persecuted um, just because we're doing well now? Friday is, in theory, a free day for all the drivers, so that means golf for Nigel. At the top of Montangel is the magnificently manicured Monte Carlo Golf Club. Nigel's playing in a competition here today, but two 28 handicappers won't make life easy. I think you'll agree that you have the most astonishing backdrop of any golf course in the world. Here you have Monte Carlo. You can actually hear in the background some Formula 3 cars running around the streets as we speak at this moment. I mean, and what a beautiful setting. One thing I can promise you, if you hook the ball to the left, you don't go and look for it. It's a long way down there. Follow us around and enjoy it. After running around the golf course, there was a further shock in store for our beleaguered cameraman. <laughs> and then off to a camel press conference in the harbour by boat with the whole family.
this is supposed to be a day off. And there's more. Dinner with Renault at L'Hôtel Hermitage. William's Adrian Newey chats to Ferrari's Ivan Capelli as Saturday qualifying dawns. While the Monaco residents tried to shop, Nigel put in an electrifying lap, clipping two seconds off his best time on Thursday in the dying moments of the session. Pole again and second place for Patrese. Alessi splits the McLarens and Schumacher is sixth. And would you say that this is your most vital pole position so far? Absolutely, this, this yeah. year. And it's very, very special to get pole position in Monte Carlo anyway. And, uh, you know, the way it actually transpired today and doing the time and the speed that we did was, uh, you know, extraordinary. Race day finally arrives. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, nine o'clock. I'm late. I'm about a half an hour late going to the pits. Slept a bit heavy, but uh, as you can see, the weather's on our side and... Uh, We've got a uh, warm-up in literally an hour and a half's time. We just hope that uh, everything runs well this morning. Um, it's going to certainly be an interesting day, but we did the business yesterday by getting the on-pole position. And, of course, it's a late race today, 3.30. So uh, I hope the weather stays with us, because it could obviously rain later. Lots of mixed emotions at the moment, but uh, extremely happy at this time, and I hope that it continues to be so. And, Whatever the outcome, uh, I'll be speaking to you later. Have a good one. The crowds mingle in this beautiful setting and the atmosphere is uniquely French. Nigel accelerates away to a perfect start. But Ayrton Senna steals a march over Patrese at the first bend. Nigel leads for 71 laps, but disaster looms. A suspected puncture means a late pit stop, and as the team fight to remove the wheel, Senna streaks past. Nigel fights in the most thrilling end to a race seen in years, but passing proves impossible. So McLaren clinched their first victory of the year with the Williams pairing relegated to second and third. Points also for Brundle and Gasho. I think I can honestly say that it's probably the greatest second place I've had in my career. Um, and probably the most important second place I've had in the career because we could have so easily been put out of the race with the problem we had. So to get the car back to the pits and get the wheel changed and go out again. And, and we were, what, this close from really winning the race. It's a bit of pill to swallow when you're 30 seconds in front with only 10 or 12 laps to go, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it's motor racing. Many things can go wrong, and as been shown today, it does go wrong occasionally, but I think we bounced back um, very well. Um, I feel the championship, uh, you know, is all about gathering points. I have scored in all six races to date. And I think from the championship point of view, that is very significant and very important. Um, we could have so easily had an accident in the tunnel when the wheel came loose. And um, so, uh, you know, I've got half a smile on my face. I mean, as you say, you've had ten laps to go. It seemed a formality, didn't it? What, what happened exactly? Well, I'm not quite sure. I thought it was a puncher, but um, the tyre is intact. Um, what's happened is the wheel nut has come undone, and then the wheel in the tunnel from being in this position went that position, and it machined the inside of the wheel, and it acted as a brake. And then obviously the car did that uh, as well, because the wheel was flopping around on the back. We were very lucky the wheel nut didn't come off completely, and the wheel fell, fell off, because if that would have happened, then... Uh, we wouldn't have finished the race. So, I mean, you know, we've got to be thankful. The wheel nut came undone to a certain extent and then jammed. And that's why we had a long pit stop. Long pit stop. Um, so, uh, 
you know, we were unlucky and lucky at the same time. And the record books will show that you came second in the 50th Monaco Grand Prix, but everybody that saw it will know that it was a moral victory for you. I probably agree with that because just coming back to the hotel now, a complete stranger said you won the race today. And that's very nice. It's not comforting because it's not the extra four points that I wanted, but it's very nice that the public, you know, see fit to actually volunteer these things to me and and it gives you a good feeling, that's for certain. And um, I've got an affinity with uh, uh, the fans. So uh, as long as they think I've won, probably that's all that matters. Monaco was a big test for William's revolutionary active ride system. But what exactly does it do and how does it work? Nigel explains. With the active ride car, what you've got to understand, and I've got to be very political now because obviously we're going into the future here and we don't want to sort of give away too many secrets about what it might or might not be able to do. But the objective of an active ride car, you throw away springs, dampers, shock absorbers, all that kind of thing. You don't have any roll bars on the car. And everything is electronically controlled. And basically aerodynamics in a race car that when you go over 100 miles an hour play a very, very important part. In fact, over 50 miles an hour, uh, the aerodynamics is, is phenomenal. And therefore, if you can control the ride height of the car, because with normal springs and suspension, the faster you go, the more download you get on the car and the closer the car gets to the ground. Well, of course, with an active ride car, it's being at any speed the active ride is controlling the ride height of the car, and that is the air going underneath the car as well as the air going across the top of it. So therefore, you can maximize your aerodynamics effect at slow speed, medium speed, and high speed. And you can, theoretically, practically, it's a lot harder, but theoretically, you can control the car's aerodynamics and um, or try I'd say not control but you try to optimize them so therefore in any speed in any corner you try and get the best balance from the car and the computer is doing this for you but you have to give the information to the computer and it's a step into the future because then you can put various parameters into the uh, active ride where the car can actually tilt before it gets to a corner the car can actually change its ride height before it goes into a slow corner. On braking, it can do something else to actually help the car's performance and to actually help it ride bumps. And therefore, it's got all these facilities, which I might add a lot of them are useless, but they're still there. Uh, whereas a normal car, you don't have. But of course, with the redundancy it has, and because it is ultimately controlled by software and a computer, you've got to remember that if the slightest thing goes wrong with it, it can cause you to have an accident immediately. It can cause you to break down and obviously have an electrical failure. You've got a problem that you just don't finish a race. And it's as complicated as heck. Montreal, Canada. And it's only from the air that one can put into perspective the circuit of the Ile Notre Dame for round seven. Friday morning. It's going to be a real tough one this weekend. Why? Because uh, Honda have got a lot more power now. Uh, they'll be on a high winning in Monte Carlo. Um, we haven't made any improvements, unfortunately, at this moment in time with the engine or the uh, chassis, so it's still status quo from the Williams team. But the exciting thing from our point of view is the next race, the in the French Grand Prix, we have the new engine that we're going to actually race, which is the RS4. So we, we do have something up our sleeve which is imminently coming. Uh, but unfortunately for this one, I think it's going to be the toughest one yet this year. There are no Renault hire cars here, so Nigel and company sample the delights of a Mercedes 500 SL. As Montreal celebrates its 350th anniversary, the city's modern tower blocks mingle easily with the historic architecture. Circuit Gilles Villeneuve is within earshot of old Montreal, and the battle today was being won by McLaren Honda. All Nigel could do was sit and watch Ayrton Senna set the pace. In Nigel's hotel suite at the Hilton, we find out why. Well, Nigel, he did warn us after Monaco that the McLaren Hondas had bridged that power gap. 
Yes, I mean, it's been an exciting day, and I don't know whether you'll get some footage, but I had a fantastic spin this morning at the end of the main straight, and did about two 360s and almost hit the barrier, and fortunately we didn't. Had two cars coming either side of me as well at the same time, so, uh, but we were struggling today. Um, we had a few problems with the car. I lost my tea car this morning through uh, an active ride problem. Uh, the engine's been changed tonight, mainly because uh, we feel that uh, it's not up to speed. Um, but really, we just basically weren't quick enough today. So instead of being the, the normal position, if you like, on the front row of the grid, we're only a meagre fourth place. But um, under the conditions, I'm happy to be that. Saturday, and it's like Barcelona all over again. Now, I know you'll be rolling because you want the expression on my face when I come out here. But I mean, uh, what can one say except uh, we're hoping for a nice sunny day and we have uh, rain pouring out the skies. Although it does look like it's abated at the moment. But we can live in hope, can't we? Uh, I think there's about two hours before we practice this morning, but uh, I don't think this morning's practice will be dry. But hopefully by one o'clock the track should be dry and uh, you never know, we might be able to go quicker. If the grid does stay as it uh, was formed yesterday, I'm obviously starting in fourth place and that doesn't excite me at all. Otherwise, it's back into the office within the next hour, breakfast at the circuit, and try and put that smile back on the face where it should be. We'll see you later. A patient wait in the wet is rewarded with a coveted signature. The space age creation that is Montreal's Olympic Stadium monopolizes the cityscape. Brave the 45 degree incline for a funicular ride to the top of the 175 meter tower and you'll certainly be rewarded there's a view to the battleground of Ile Notre Dame. Nigel was quickest in the morning and the final qualifying session, but he improved to only third position on the grid, with hundreds of a second splitting the top three. Nigel, pretty exhausted after tiring effort today. I'm actually shattered, and um, the reason for being shattered is the race distance tomorrow is 78 laps. We actually did 90 laps today in the warm-up this morning and qualifying this afternoon. We did 80-something laps yesterday, so we've already done more than two Grand Prix distances, and we've still got the race to come. So, I mean, not only myself, but there's a lot of drivers in the pit lane, and my teammate, that are very tired. And you made an improvement up to third spot today? Made a slight improvement up, up into third from fourth, but um, track conditions were very, very difficult, and uh, third's better than fourth, but it's going to be a tough fight tomorrow, for sure. A sombre tribute for Quebec's hero Gilles Villeneuve, a sparkling career so tragically muted. The only way to beat the bridge access chaos on race day is to ride the city's metro to Ile Saint Hélène and thence a short walk. Nigel makes a fabulous start, streaking past Patrese and almost getting past Senna at the first bend. But fate intervenes again. Nigel spins off violently while attempting to pass Senna and he's out of the race. With Senna also out, the race is left to the mercy of Berger and Schumacher cruises home in second place. When Nigel was sure on the television, you were clearly a, a very angry man. Can you tell us exactly what happened? Did you come alongside him? I'd rather not. I mean, it's history now, and uh, you know, it's one of those things. The stewards are looking into it, um, but uh, you know, fortunately, we're we're intact. I think it's um, justice that uh, his car stopped, and it's very unfortunate for my teammate Ricardo because he had gearbox problems. But uh, I mean, the race ended up being a mighty strange race. 
I wouldn't have made the overtaking maneuver unless I felt very comfortable with it, and I did. Otherwise, I could have just sat behind like I was all those laps. And then obviously that happened, but uh, looking at it on the positive side, nobody's got any closer to me. My teammate's still the next closest, at 28 points behind. So, um, yes, uh, Schumacher and the uh, Benetton is closer to my teammate, but I suppose uh, what mattered was no one came closer on the championship. But uh, we'll wait and see what the next one. Of course, we, there's a great English saying, we live to fight another day. And fight, he certainly will. One last treat in store for us in Nigel's Florida home, a tour of a rather special room. Well, welcome to the trophy room. Um, we've got a few specials in here I'd just like to point out to you. Uh, this is a collection of Waterford Crystal. And in 1985, which was my first Grand Prix win, starting at the top, which was in England at Brands Hatch, which was the European Grand Prix, the second one in 86, which was also at Brands Hatch, which was an epic battle between Nelson Piquet and myself. And then in 87, the race actually changed from Brands Hatch to Silverstone, and we won creating a hat-trick of wins in my own country. And then we had two second places uh, in between uh, 87 and uh, 91, and the one at the end there in the middle is not Waterford Crystal, but that was the winner's trophy of last year in 1991. So four race wins in my home country in two seconds, very special. And then moving along here, we've obviously collected some other uh, trophies around the world, which is from Mexico, South Africa, uh, Italy. So uh, what we've got to hope for, we might have to sort of make a little bit more room this year, but I hope to sort of get a few more to join the uh, collection. After his performance so far this year, there's no doubt that he will. Join us again for all the news and inside stories from the other locations on the Formula One calendar with your host, the leader of the championship, Nigel Mansell.